Now, what was the, what was the attitude of the leaders of the longshoremen to African American workers? Before 1934, only two peers had black workers in San Francisco. And they had gotten their jobs during the strike in 1919. But Bridges had several approaches to workers who didn't support the strike. that showed his ability as, as a working class leader and took into account the long years of owner run Jim Crow and racist attitudes on the docks. The white strike breaking scabs and goons recruited after the strike began were out. The dock work, but the dock workers who worked through the strike, who were working before the strike and worked through the strike, were forgiven, a sign of strength of the struggle. Bridges told them, you will be judged from what you do from here on. You didn't understand. You weren't able to get, we weren't able to get to you right away. Now join the union and fly right from here on. Everyone is welcome. You weren't the ones who actually came to break the strike. If we want to get rid of you, this is to the white workers who worked through the strike. If we want to get rid of you, we can. We can hard time you. Bridges later stated that many of these so-called loyal employees became the best union workers he ever had. To the African American workers who worked or took jobs during the strike, Bridges had a third attitude. He was adamant they would keep their jobs. He told the white workers, look, the only way these guys ever got a job was because of the strike. The bosses saw to that. No one can blame them for that. Let's right now say, you got a job as a working stiff just like everybody else. No discrimination. Union controlled hiring halls found ways, imaginative ways, to ensure that African American workers were hired together with white workers. Fairness in hiring, anti-racist agitation, and union imposed penalties for racist behavior won the day. That's the strength of the struggle and what they had done. Bridges was quoted as saying that if there were only two longshoremen left on the docks, he would guaranteed one would be black and one would be white. Before and during the strike, Bridges had gone to the African American community, to the churches, and asked for a hearing. He encouraged the community to support the strike, and he guaranteed there would be, it would be an end to discrimination on the docks, and he was as good as his word. Now, I found a quote from Thomas Fleming, who was a co-founder of the San Francisco's African American Weekly, and he had this to say about his experience on the docks. He said, in 1934, one of the low years of the Depression, black workers could only work on two piers in San Francisco. If you went to any other pier, you might be beaten by thugs. In the shape-up system, the bosses held absolute power. No one had guarantee of a job unless he was the pet of the dock boss or paid a sum of his daily earnings. Before this time, I had the view, this is Thomas Fleming speaking, I had the view that the trade union movement was just formed to continue discrimination. But Bridges asked for support and promised that when the strike ended, African American workers would work on every dock on the West Coast. And he kept his word. When the ILA was recognized by the ship owners, African American workers got the same work as everybody else. In 1936, two years later, when the union was forced, again forced to strike, there was solidarity on the waterfront. Although the depression was still in full force, there was no question of scabbing. The, the union call not to scab was heard, and the owners did not dare to organize the scabs again. Now, this struggle left a rich heritage to local 10 of the ILA today. If you check their website, they have a whole list of a union is built on its members, labor unity is the key to success, the days are gone when a union can consider dealing with single employers. The basic aspirations and desires of workers throughout the world are the same. And the new type of unionism is called for, which is not confined its ambitions and demands only to wages. This is the heritage of the struggles of the general strike led by the longshore workers in the 1930s. Local 10 of the ILA has always been at the forefront of labor struggles and in the forefront of international solidarity from solidarity with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, to the Million Worker March in Washington, to more recent solidarity with Occupy Wall Street. This local still has its rank and file caucus, which is the best foundation for working class organization. This is reflected in the beginnings of a new movement, the organizing success of the Boston bus drivers, the sit down of Rep Republic worker, windows and workers, and other struggles. In every working class struggle, solidarity is the key. 
Now, every worker should study as much as they can about the past struggles, particularly the rich, study, the rich period of the 1930s. The ruling class has rewritten our history to say that only the 1% have the skills, the will, and the ability to run society. They have written out of our history the role of socialist and communist class conscious workers whose sacrifice and patient work was essential to the success of the struggle. Just as the old kings and nobles could only justify themselves by stating that they, they ruled by divine right, they had been chosen by God to rule, so the capitalists can only justify their rule by telling us that they are the most enterprising, the most intelligent, and the most able to run society. To the capitalists, the working class is not worthy to be in the history books except as a footnote or a slight mention in passing. Only we, only Marxists can tell the truth that all wealth, that everything of value comes from labor. The capitalists can't say this because their wealth comes not from their own labor, but from exploiting the labor of others. Marx was the first to state that the working class is the first and only class that is able to become the ruling class that is not an exploiting class. Marx has often stated that the ideas of any age are the ideas of the ruling class, ideas that are force-fed to the workers from cradle to grave. How little the capitalist media or TV shows or movies show workers, except to show us being prejudiced and divided against each other. Capitalist culture force-feeds us an image of ourselves that serves only capitalist concepts of how they want workers to be, how they need workers to be. When we learn our own history, we loosen the grip of the 1% over us. The history of the 1930s shows that when communist and socialist workers are able to chart a route to reach the workers, when revolutionaries are able to listen and learn what is needed to build a struggle and how to win anti-racist solidarity, they become enablers. They enable the working class not to become heroes in the bourgeois sense, not to become better than we are, but to become who we really are, a non-exploiting class capable of running society. Lenin said it best in what is to be done. When we have detachments of worker revolutionaries who have gone through extensive preparation, no police force in the world will be able to stop us, for we will enjoy the confidence in the widest mass of workers. Bridges and his comrades helped make what seemed impossible happen we can do the same. You know, sometimes something is developed or invented and then it's hard to see what life was like before that happened. And, you know, like email, seems like it wasn't that long ago we had it, now it's hard to think of what it was like. But I, I think socially it's, it's that way too. I mean, before Bridges and others organized the industry, it seemed impossible to do. It seemed like Workers could be just replaced easily, and how do you organize that? I remember thinking at Shape Up uh, years ago at Oswego. They had a port, and you stand there, and you, you know, I hated the foreman. I didn't like the people who got picked, and I was jealous, and then I felt like I was worthless, and then I felt like people who didn't get picked with me were worth. It's just so, it's just so beating down. So the idea of, of organizing uh, industrial unions around the docks seemed impossible until it was done. But he did it. He found imaginative ways of uniting the nationalities to win. And I think that that's the lesson that conditions are different today, but I don't think they're any harder. I can't imagine how hard it must have seemed to organize industrial unions until it happened. But he did it. He, he consulted, he listened, and he found a, a new, new, like uh, Naomi said, think outside the box. He found a new way to organize, and then it seemed like it, it, seemed, it, seemed like it was obvious that you could organize the plants, whereas before it seemed not possible. I think that's similar to today, where things seem so difficult. You know, there's very few jobs, there's technology. We need to find new imaginative ways of struggling, and we can. But I think we also need to appreciate what can be done, because many times in the past, things that have seemed impossible were done by organizing the workers and listening. I think that's what I got out of studying the, the 30s, is not just the history, but what can really be accomplished that, you know, afterwards seemed obvious, but before that seemed impossible. What can really be done when we organize the workers and, and think creatively?